The young, he has a much better connection with the young than almost anyone I've seen. And I don't, I don't see, you know, people say, well, he lives in a totally different circumstance. Well, he, he, doesn't, he, he certainly doesn't live in a council house. But I don't think that any monarch has ever come to the country, ever come to the throne, knowing as much about people and lives. So, I actually um, thought you had been at the last coronation. You weren't allowed at the service because you were four? I was four, yeah. Four. But you do have a great memory of the day. I do have a memory of the day and that my grandparents uh, left Number 10 Dining Street in their carriage. And I remember my sister Emma and I being on the doorstep and watching and waving them off. And this absolutely extraordinary. I remember my grandmother looked absolutely wonderful in this beautiful petunia colored robes of the dame commander of the British Empire. And my grandfather, I think, I think was in Garth. He was in Garth uniform. Now he was the Queen's first prime minister. He was the Queen's first prime minister. Yeah. And he was quite an elderly gent at that time, wasn't he? I can't remember how old he was. Um, I, he was, you know, there's a charming story, Jock Colville in his diaries, who was Churchill's private secretary, was said that, the, that he found my grandfather in floods of tears after the king had died. And when he, and they were talking about it, and he was terribly worried, my grandfather, that he wouldn't be able to help the queen because he was so old. But of course, in fact, it worked. It was the most marvelous relationship by all accounts. And, and um, he loved being with her, loved it. And there was a marvellous thing of saying that, um, that someone listening outside the door, not listening outside the door, but could hear the peals of laughter coming from... from um, I think they mostly talked about racing together. And actually, I think the late Queen broke protocol and went to your grandfather's funeral. She did. It, she, she was an unbelievably gracious uh, and moving gesture. And not only did she do that, she did uniquely, she arrived before my grandmother and she was in her place when my grandfather's coffin arrived, which was absolutely, I remember even when I was 16, I was just even then thinking this can't be the right way around. Um, but the Queen was there first. I mean, they, they did, the King, my grandfather served six of the Kings and Queens of Britain and he was commissioned into the British Army in the reign of Queen Victoria and he was the Queen's first Prime Minister. And, you know, that is a, a tremendous spectrum of history. And I think, although the Queen actually, you know, quite regularly, I think, didn't agree with my grandfather, I'm sure, because my grandfather had views that probably, um, that she thought were possibly outdated, I don't know. But she clearly listened very carefully to everything that he said, but I think she immensely uh, respected his knowledge and, and of the history and the sort of tapestry of the history of the country and the social history as well. So on May the 6th you will be at the coronation this time. I will, I'm very honoured to be there. Of the King and also of your friend and that's that's probably very significant. What, what will that be like for you? <coughs> well, <coughs> it's going to be, a, a, I'm a terrible, I come from a family of terrible blubbers. I mean, we're inveterate blubbers. It'll be a very moving and powerful occasion. And the service of the coronation is in itself. I mean, I've read the order of service of the last coronation. And the words and the symbolism are unbelievably powerful. And, and they're powerful for all time. They really are powerful. They're not... You know, they're, they're very old words, but they're very well suited to the modern setting. The oath that the king will take, the, everything is absolutely, it, it's, it's an extraordinary thing about the British sort of constitution and the way it's all put together. That it's completely elastic. It seems to have coped incredibly well down the years. So it'll be a very moving occasion. And I've, I've I, you know, I've been very fortunate to know the king for a very long time and we met when we were 12 and I'm 75 and he's now 75 too I think and um, I've watched him and you know he, he has I don't suppose any 
one has ever inherited the throne or any position better informed or better equipped to do it than he has. And so, I, I mean, in a way, you know, one is looking at the, the sort of culmination of years of preparation. I mean, he certainly, of course, I mean, I thought his words after his mother died, after the Queen died, were incredibly powerful and very steadying. And he knows that he's stepping into very big shoes, very big shoes, but he's his own man. Well, he really is, and he's, really is. he's doing so at the age of 75. And the Queen, I've seen footage of the Queen's coronation, and she was um, very charismatic, 26-year-old, beautiful young woman. And it is hugely moving. Um, there's no doubt, and this isn't being ageist because I'm no spring chicken myself, but the coronation of a 75-year-old man is, is a very different very different prospect. No, I, Am think, I, being I think that's true. I mean, in, in the same way that the coronation of the Queen took place under very different circumstances to the coronation now in terms of, of Britain's position at the end of the war and rationing and pretty dour state of affairs, it was a great golden beacon in our lives. There's no doubt about it. It isn't quite then, because it was a full of promise and hope. And, you know, my grandfather saw it as the, the new Elizabethan era. And um, so this isn't quite the same thing. Of course it's not the same thing. But people are carping, aren't they, um, inevitably, about such an opulent occasion at a time when so many people in this country are having a tough time. Do you know, I, I don't think... I mean, you, you, will, you know, if you go to find someone who will carp, you'll find someone who will carp. I don't detect much carping. I think the British love ceremonial. I think they expect it to be what it will be, which is the most extraordinary, splendid, magnificent occasion with all the panoply of the British state. After all, this is the single most important thing that the state does, or the state does, that the church does, is to crown uh, to 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 um, supervise a coronation, and I think people will love it. And I should be very surprised if the audience around the world isn't absolutely enormous and in this country. But of course, you know, and um, that's why I think the king has been at pains, and I, everyone associated with this thing has been at pains to actually say. Not that we don't, that people call it dumbing down. It's not dumbing down, but it will be slightly less, um, uh, uh, um, uh, I imagine, than the last coronation, because in the last coronation we had a million men under arms. So, I mean, the actual number of soldiers and, yes. and, and, and the, the, you know, the, 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 every, uh, every Commonwealth country sent a huge detachment of troops. I mean, I do remember going to Hyde Park, which is where the... Royal Canadian Mounted Police were quartered, and there they were, the, the Mounties, with the, and I just never forget the smell. I can remember the smell now. Absolutely wonderful. What was the smell of what? The horses Mounties? and canvas yes, and yes, tack yes, and yeah. leather, soap leather and swords and, you know. So we will see some of that yes, at this you'll see. Yes, you will see some of that, but not on... This is the thing, a comparison I was trying to make. This is not, I mean, this is not going to be the same as was the Queen's. No. And ha has the King talked to you um, about how he feels about this very, very, um, well, I mean, it's a huge responsibility he's about to bear. He's already bearing it, of course. But has he ever expressed any doubts about any of this? No. Um, when I say, when you say doubts, I don't think doubts. I mean, there's a sort of inevitability to it but not doubts, it's going, to ha it's going to happen. The King has always been very, very at pains to, I think, the, the point he made about, you know, there are going to be several people from other faiths there. I think that's terribly important. I mean, all that is going to be new and very much reflective of Britain as it is today, as opposed to Britain as it was 70 years ago. Um, I've never actually discussed... I mean, he, he, he as a person, he takes these things very, very seriously. And you will see in the service uh, where he has laid his hand on it. I mean, particularly in the music. I mean, the music, he's commissioned several new pieces of music, um, the orchestras which he is 
been patron for over 60, 50, 60 years, are all going to be playing. There are going to be eight. There are going to be musicians from eight different orchestras with whom he's associated are going to be playing under the direction of Sir Anthony Papano. And I was very... I, was, I, was, I, I know what Sir Anthony meant. I saw him interviewed, and he said, it will be music to touch the soul, and I think it will be. And I think, to your, to your point about carping, there will always be people who, for one reason or another, don't want this to happen. But by and large, I think people will rejoice in it. And I think they will... It's a good moment for us, because we do do this very well. I don't know what you thought. I mean, I thought that the, the, the Queen's funeral was the most astonishingly organised, beautifully run, not a single mistake, foot perfect. Yes, uh, but that, in a way, uh, it was a reflection of her and yes. this incredible presence that she'd been in all our lives. Mm. But she was also a person who was an, a, a bit of an enigma. I mean, I think she, she kept her own feelings very much to herself, her own opinions. We never knew what they were. Um, her son, the King, is, is a very different character. And I wonder, he has in the past been accused of meddling. He said himself he'll change now. He'll have to change because that's what this new role brings, brings with it. Um, how is he about all that? Well, he was asked, um, he was asked by someone this very question, I think just before he, he inherited the throne. And he said, well, you may think I'm very stupid, but I'm not that stupid. Of course, he knows that he has to change. He can't possibly, I mean, the constitutional requirements are such, and he is a stickler for the constitutional requirements. And can I just say that on the question of meddling, that was the most overdone piece of hype that I've ever heard. I mean, i give you an example of it. I was Minister of State for the Armed Forces at the time, and the King, uh, Prince Wales, as he then was, went on a visit to Hong Kong. And he was shown round one of the barracks in Hong Kong, and the, uh, the accommodation was definitively below par. And when he got back, he told me, he wrote to me and said, I think you ought to know that you have soldiers living there in unsatisfactory conditions. And he was absolutely right, and it was rectified. So, you know, I think the the, the argument of meddling, he didn't meddle. Well, I suppose I could put the counterpoint no, no. to it. Perhaps his meddling was in some ways a good thing, and it's a shame it's now going to have to stop. Well, that, that, that could be true, but it does have to stop, and, and it has stopped, and the King... I mean, I think it's interesting, the, um, John Kerry said, who, who is a very good friend of the King's, who is here on the, one of the environment things, pre cop The American politician. The American, the American politics, former senator and, and secretary of state, um, saying that, of course, the King has for so long been a champion of the environment that it's almost passed beyond politics. One knows what his views are, and in many of them he's proved to be right, but he can't take place in any overt politics, nor has he ever done so. And I, I absolutely assure you that he, he's m much too conscious and, and well-schooled to breach any of the constitutional limitations. It just won't happen. And the royal family, um, it, we all have families and none of them are straightforward, let's face it, uh, but we do know perhaps almost too much about the royal family's problems. I wonder whether you believe that has taken some of the sheen off. The, uh, Prince Harry, obviously, is one example. Uh, Prince Andrew, and they're not in the same category, but yeah. Prince Andrew is, is another. What, what would you say about that? Well, in, in respect of Prince Harry, I just think it's the most tragic. I mean, I can't put myself in the position where my own son, if he did something like that to me, it would, it would just be the cruelest and one would mind. And of course, it, it was no different. Of course, the king, very, very sad, tragic. I mean, but as you say, right, we all have families. We, we'll, we've all lived through it. Um, but it, it was a terrible blow. Um, and on Prince Andrew, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, but obviously, I mean, the king is a, a loyal, fa uh, a loyal brother, and I'm sure we'll try and help him in whatever way he can. But um, it's a very sad state of affairs. But there's, you certainly don't believe that there's any role for him, any public role for Prince Andrew anymore. I can't see one. 
And for Prince Harry, the fact that he is at least going to be present, um, do you believe, or perhaps you know, whether or not that has brought the King a degree of comfort? Well, I, I mean, I, I think it would be a great pity if Prince Harry hadn't come um, to his father's coronation. Um, and he is coming, and I, I, just, you know, I just hope that we can keep all this in proportion. This is the day about the King and the Queen, not about Prince Harry. Are you concerned at all that there might be protests on the day? Well, I think almost certain there'll be protests on the day. Um, we live in an age of protest, and you know, I mean, from egg chucking to God knows what. But I mean, I think people need to be very careful. You know, I, I, I read in the, all these alarming stories that you've read too. Uh, and I pray that, I, and certainly I think the police who do a wonderful job policing these things and the military together, I hope will ensure that there isn't trouble. But it, it, you know, it's entirely possible there'll be a lot of yarbury. Not a lot of it, there'll be. Sort of few voices whose yes. lifeless bodies will be passed to the front of the crowd. <laughs> well, we don't, want, we don't want anyone to be harmed. No, of course not. I mean, that, but what I, I'm saying is, you know, I don't think it's very popular with the crowd. Well, it won't be popular with a large percentage of the no. crowd who do turn out. Yeah. Um, but I, want, I mean, republicanism has never been an especially popular cause in this country, but it does appear to be gaining at the moment. Um, is the king conscious? Well, he must be conscious of that. What does he say about it? I, you know, I've never discussed it with him. Um, and I mean, you know, of course it's been ever present. I mean, I was reading um, Lady Longford's book about Queen Victoria. There was a tremendous surge of republicanism actually in her reign. She became very, eventually became very worried about it. Um, you know, I, I watch these um, people. That, I mean, there are people who are just doing it to draw attention to themselves, and there are others who genuinely believe it's wrong. And, and, and I saw the, the man who runs the anti-monarchy organisation interviewed the other day on the television. I mean, I thought you were talking absolute rubbish, but it's very well put, and um, clearly we'll have support. This is, I think, Mr. Smith from Mr. Republic. Smith yeah. of the of the uh, I can't remember what it's called. Which is called Republic. It's called Republic. Republic. So, you know, and they're, they're perfectly, it's a free country and they're perfectly entitled to do it. I hope they just temper it and, and, and don't do anything silly. So you, you definitely don't believe that this is the last coronation? No, I don't believe this is the last coronation. And I think that each, um, each member, each king, each monarch has always done this job in their own way. It has evolved the job. And I think that the king understands very well about the importance of his, and he has very good connections with people. I was watching the other day where there were a lot of young people, and it said that he's, how are the young getting? I mean, the young, he has a much better connection with the young than almost anyone I've seen. And I don't, I don't see, you know, people say, well, he lives in a totally different circumstance. Well, he, he, he doesn't, he, he certainly doesn't live in a council house. But I don't think that any monarch has ever come to the country, ever come to the throne, knowing as much about people and lives. And look you know what the Prince's Trust has done. It wasn't created out of the blue just for a sort of jaunt. It's helped over a million people. I, I've totally, and I've, I've met and interviewed people who've yeah. been helped by the Prince's Trust, but it would be ridiculous if I didn't just make the point that he doesn't just not live in a council house. He has frankly, any number of huge homes at his disposal. And people are bound to find that, at times, frankly, profoundly irritating. But I think that, um, I, I'm not sure what the King's arrangements are going to be. You know, I don't sort of know where you're going to live next week. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean... Well, he's got plenty to choose yeah, from. But, but, you know, he will make the arrangements that are necessary. I mean, he is, he, he, he has a, a, a extraordinary reputation of the king for being, um, he's always sort of portrayed as being very extravagant. I think he is stylish, but he's also frugal. I mean, he's very, very careful. And, and I think you will find there are going to be very big changes in these houses. Oh, well, that's interesting. Give, can then, you give... Well, I, don't, I genuinely don't know. I mean, I only know what I read in the newspapers. I really don't. It's not the sort of thing you sit down and 
ready to discuss. I don't mean that. Pattern, no, I mean we but don't. I've to be never fair, never discussed it. With we you. don't ask our friends about how much money they've got, do we? On the whole, <laughs> no. But what I mean is that, for instance, at um, I know at Balmoral, they are building. I mean, the king intends to use it much more for sort of public duties, um, and. Um, you know, it has wonderful facilities there. He intends many more people to come and see it. And they're making a new sort of visitor centre and everything else to enable that to happen. Um, there have been some very big changes, I know, at Sandringham. I mean, he, he is very sensible, the King, and, about this, and, and, um, I, I, and aware of the fact that, as you say, some people don't feel this is, you know, too many houses, too many palaces, but it's not true, actually. Can we just have a, a quick word about the Queen? Because we haven't, I'm conscious yes. that I haven't mentioned a Queen, a, a, the Queen concert I'm talking about now, not the late Queen. Yeah. I mean, there are many people who um, I think she herself might say that she would be surprised to find herself in this position on May the 6th. W what, what would you say about that? I think it's been a jolly long, hard journey. Uh, all I can say is that uh, I'm, I, I cannot tell you how wonderful it is when you have two old friends who are clearly in love with each other, clearly make each other very happy, and have ended up happy in their lives. It doesn't happen to everyone. No one set out at an early stage to make anything go wrong ever. But as it is, it's turned out well, and I think that she has done, uh, I think, the Queen has done a really admirable job and she's, you know, she, she will do an admirable job because she's a completely straightforward person. I mean, what you see is what you get. And someone said, thank God for someone who likes a fag and a pint. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I wasn't expecting you to say that. Yeah. Kind of um, bear with me. Um, but do you know what I mean? I mean, she, one, of, one of her greatest, um, one of her greatest um, qualities, I think, is her, her authenticity. She's absolutely straightforward. I mean, you, what you see, as I say, is what you get. So in terms of her relationship with Prince Harry, would you say that she tried? She tried her best? I'm sure she did. But, you know, I, this is not territory on which I have ever strayed. So, uh, well, that's interesting in itself, I guess. Because no, no, because I, I you know, um, I just haven't. And, and because you feel you couldn't? No, because I, I wouldn't. I'm interested in that, um, because I suppose that uh, we all, for, for, I'm fortunate to have some very, very no, good friends. but there friends. are things that but, we yeah, Well, that's about. what I was trying to, uh, okay. is that a difference? I mean, yeah. there's a difference between your, this, this friendship, this clearly very long-standing friendship yeah. with the King, but it does have certain boundaries. Well, you know, all friendships have boundaries. Um, and, and there are things that you that I, I have I have never discussed with the king and but of course I wouldn't I mean if the king wanted to talk to me about it I'd be very happy to do so but it, all I know is how deeply hurtful it has been and it was to him of course it was hurtful you could see it written all over his face you and put oneself in his position it's just painful beyond words but you know with a bit of luck and a following wind you never know and as the great day approaches, um, what, in, what do you do to, to a friend of yours who's going to become a king or going to be crowned the next day or in the coming days? Do you ring them up? Do you send them a card? What, what, do, you, what do you do? What's the etiquette here? Well, there's no etiquette. Um, I mean, it's no secret. I'm not a, I'm not, I am entirely partial in this conversation. I love him and admire him very, very much indeed. And I think it's going to be... All, all you can do, I think, to friends, like your friends or my friends or any of our friends, and they're not different, is to be loyal to them and supportive of them. And, and um, I think the best thing I can do is to, is to, is to I shall write him a letter before the coronation. Um, uh, wishing him bon chance. I mean, what a moment. I mean, this is, he's been crowned in the same Abbey Church as was William the Conqueror. I mean, it, it's a whole sort of cathartic moment for the history of this country. And the, 
um, it's a hell of a moment. And it, it, in the same way that I think we all both know that the Queen had real backbone and real, and you could see that at our own coronation, 26 years old. And he is the same, he has a backbone and he will do it very well.